This is Edwin DeCastro, creator of Lost Between Worlds. You can find me at lostbetweenworldcomics.com, on Twitter at Lost Between World One, on Instagram, Lost underscore Between underscore Worlds One, and on Facebook, Lost Between Worlds Book Series. And this is Two Geeks Talking. Enjoy. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic creator. I've just uh, recently read his work, and to say it's uh, a beautiful masterpiece is is not giving it true justice. I think it's a really well-written comic, really well-drawn comic, beautiful colors, everything like that. But we're joined today by the ever-talented Edwin DeCastro, of course, creator of Lost Between Worlds. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you. That was an amazing intro. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person and, of course, about your comic, tell us who you are and what it's all about. My name is Edwin DeCastro. I've been an aspiring writer since being a kid, and we're just finally starting to make it happen. Lost Between Worlds is basically about a Grim Reaper named Gwyn Abnud who collects the souls of the dead and takes them to the afterlife to be judged. And she gets tasked with collecting the soul of someone who claims to be kind of like bipolar. He's dissociative identity disorder. So yeah, she's kind of like trying to figure out, is he trying to find a loophole to cheat death? What is he doing here? Is he even lying or telling the truth? And yeah, there seems to be a looming apocalypse in the distance. So she's got a lot on her plate. Not to mention uh, being overworked as the, as a uh, green reaper too. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> But that's just like any type of any job in general. We're all overworked and underpaid. So. Oh, tell me about it. So what was the first seed that popped into your head when you came up with the idea for Lost Between Worlds? Well, I don't know if you've ever seen an anime called Death Note or read the manga. It's a story about Grim Reapers, kind of, where they have a book that when you write someone's name in it, they die of a heart attack unless you specify why they die. And there was this one scene that always kind of triggered my thought where they asked like, what was their purpose? And they don't even remember because they've lived so long. So to me, I was like, they had to have basically been like Grim Reapers, right? Because they can see someone's lifespan and know when they're going to die and everything. So that thought just kind of trailed off into Lost Between Worlds. So then what about the creation of the Grim Reaper Gwyneth itself though? I mean, did, did something like, this is the type of character I want and this is the type of visuals I'd like? So I kind of wanted to base all my characters on different gods of death from different cultures and religions. So she's based on Gwyn Abnud from the Welsh uh, mythology. And I kind of took the, the mannerisms and personality of uh, Uma Thurman in Pulp Fiction. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've seen or played Castlevania, but Camilla from that, I kind of mashed the two together. And that's how we got Gwyn. Looking at the world that you've built here, because I, I take it this is going to be a multi comic book series. Yeah. So what did you draw from then to create this world that you built? Because it's uh, it's based off of, it looks like the real world mixed in with the, the world of the dead. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of set in the real world, but it's taking all the beliefs of all the different religions and mythologies, treating it like it's all one thing, it's all true, and it's all happening around us and we just don't know it. So what is it about the other religions that you think are underrepresented or misrepresented in today's media, like in terms of comics? It's not that they're underrepresented. I just feel like, or maybe it is actually, I just feel like we need more stories based on death and things like that. Like, it's not something to be scared of. It's something to embrace in a way. Like, we can have a lot of interesting stories revolving around it. For example, some of my favorite stories besides Death Note is Bleach, another thing that revolves around death. So I just feel like it's just an aspect of life that, just, just so many interesting stories, uh, theories and stories can come out of it that we haven't explored yet. What's the difficult part about being a writer? Is it the beginning, middle, or end of, of writing a story? I think it's the middle, honestly. Because for me, I have the beginning and end already planned. It's the middle that I'm still working on. Because, you know, you can kind of catch a reader with the hook. You should hopefully have an ending for it. But it's kind of the middle where you want to keep people interested. So how do I do that, you know? So how have you kept yourself fresh then writing the middle portion of your comics? <laughs> I'm still just keeping it fresh by still doing it. <laughs> I haven't fully finished it. So then what lessons have you learned about being a comic writer that maybe when you first started, you didn't realize? As a comic writer, you really got to think about the art and the panels. Because it's one 
one thing when you're just writing the story. It's another when now you have to actually plan out what the panel will look like and to portray the story. It's almost like a director in a way where like as a director, you have to, you know, use your visual camera and be like, okay, let me frame the scene, see what should go in it. And so I think comic, like I think panels is the same way. Like how do I translate my story into these beautifully drawn art? So then what, what director would you kind of parallel yourself with when it comes to this comic? I wish I can say something along the lines of like David Lynch or Wes Craven. Those are two of my favorite directors. I wouldn't say I'm there yet, but we're working on it. <laughs> They're great storytellers. It's amazing what they've created in their careers and, and the inspirations they've drawn from and experiences as well, too, I'm sure. I think Tarantino would be another interesting person just to see, you know, what his life actually is like compared to what he publicly shows. Yeah, I think he would make an amazing comic one day if you ever tried it. Now, are you doing this yourself as the artist and writer, or are you literally have a, another team member working with you? No, I'm just a writer. I wish I could draw. <laughs> it would save so much money and time. But no, I have my team of artists that I love. Uh, I have Elton. He's the inker, the penciler. He lives in Brazil. I have Diego, who does the coloring, also from Brazil. My letterer's name is Reed. He's, I believe, based in California. And then I have another artist named Mac who helped me with some of the early designs. And he's actually drew a whole complete different version of the first issue. He's based, I think, I think it's in Switzerland, it's everywhere, all around the world. So what drew you to their creative talents? Then? I just love their art. Like, as I saw their portfolios, I found them all basically on Reddit through a subreddit called Comic Collab, which is a really great start for anybody. Found all their portfolios, loved their art as we were messaging. They're all great people, all, you know, responsible messaging back and forth, good communication. So, yeah, I just feel like this was this was the team. If you could turn your comic then into a live action, I mean, director aside, who would you have acting as your main character? I have only thought of this question for my main character. I don't know why I'm kind of attractive for her to like play Gwen. And right now I'm kind of blanking on her name, but the main actress from Mr. Robot, I don't know if you've ever seen that, yep. the one who plays his sister. I think she would be a good, like, role, like a good choice for that. In your opinion, what is the most important quality of a writer uh, in comics today? And how does that translate to your comic? That's a hard one. Important quality. Hmm. Definitely double check your work, of course. Don't just go with the first draft, but just don't be afraid of what people say and let your imagination run wild because you never know who might like it. If you feel like it could work, then just go with that. Don't let other people influence your choice and your decision in your writing. Have you had anyone influence your, your writing that you've backtracked and did it your, your way? I would say kind of recently I had my first negative review. And it didn't make me backtrack to the point where like, hmm, maybe I should rethink everything. Maybe I should just double check my, th my stuff. But also I feel like they just didn't get the, the point across because you read the first issue. So it's kind of like a setup because, you know, you can see it's a lot of issues, but I don't think they understood that. So they were just kind of confused by everything. So yeah, just sometimes, you know, some people may not get what you're trying to get across. That's understandable. I mean, obviously when it comes to, you know, starting a comic book, I mean, the first issue is never going to tell you everything. If it is, then you're Alan Moore and you're just basically laying everything out in 200 pages. Yeah, exactly. Like, what are you leaving for the rest of the whole series? You know, you got to give people food for thought, right? So looking at the themes then of your actual comic book here, now that you've, you've put it all together, what themes spoke to you once you started writing it? And what themes spoke to you afterwards that you thought, okay, now I've done it? Well, for me, it's like I said, the theme of death, I just find it so interesting. It's kind of been in my life, sadly, and really everyone's life. But I lost my father when I was young, when I was 13. So I guess it kind of hit me and I've just always been interested in that. Also, the theme of like multiple personalities. I've always liked that in stories. I'm a big fan of like Split, Fight Club and those kinds of movies. I mentioned Mr. Robot earlier, but something that kind of came up to me after, because I just wanted to write about it because I like it. But then I thought about the whole question of like, well, if this guy really does feel like he's two people in one body, why should the one personality suffer for the other person? You know, because she says, hey, I'm here to claim your soul. So why should the other guy have to, you know, die as well? So that's kind of an interesting thought. Because you're dealing with death and, and multiple personalities, what, what sort of maybe internal ethics did you have to go through mentally to make sure that it was portrayed correctly? I just want to follow the mythologies and religions as close as I can, but also 
I mean, this might sound hypocritical. I want to like put a twist to it also, but like follow it at the same time. Like for example, with Queen Abnud, I'm trying to stay faithful to like how they portray the the god of death but i gave it a feminine twist they portrayed as a male i gave it a feminine twist just because being hispanic when you talk about death you use feminine pronouns so i just felt like it, it would be right to make death in this case her you know a female but there's actually going to be other gods of death some are male some are female they'll be revealed throughout the series i was going to ask if you decided to branch off into other other deaths point of views and create stories of, of them and how they intertwine with this main character. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a whole system of grim reapers. They're all different places, different religions. So we only seen Gwyn so far, but yeah, they, they all do the same type of job. I, I love the interact uh, interaction with Charon, uh, the, the fairy master there <laughs> in the first couple of pages. I thought that was hilarious. It's like, it felt like he was like a, just a normal average person just trying to get through their day. Yeah. That's kind of what I want to portray. It's like these super visualistic and fantasy looking creatures and people like to the band, for example, they're like, well, these guys look crazy, but to them, they're just doing their job. It's like any other day, you know? So what was the hardest scene for you to write then in this book? I would say the bar scene where uh, Gwen and Dospe are talking. Cause I knew that was like, the climax of issue one basically or like the big scene where here we go here's the two main characters they're talking about the big issue how do they handle it you know i felt like the right the dialogue there should be at its peak so yeah it took a it took a good while on that one so what did you edit out of this book to be honest nothing <laughs> the first issue i felt like it has to have not everything because of course like i said we got to leave some stuff on the table but it's got to explain all the concepts so i you know i introduced gwen i introduced the band so they can be kind of gwen's first target at least to the reader so she sees how she does it then we explore of course you know a little bit of the afterlife and you know more of her job details and things like that then like i said the second half is all about those bay and the main problem at hand so yeah it was, it was just all in there i couldn't really edit anything out if, if, if i wanted to tell the complete story are you more of a, a comic reader or or film buff i guess i would say film buff because i've always watched movies i only i'm not gonna say recently but like ever since being a teenager i guess and up is when i started reading more comics because as a kid i I don't know, my parents never bought me comics, but I did watch all the superhero cartoons like Spider-Man, X-Men. I loved all that stuff, the movies. But then, yeah, when I got older, I started reading, you know, the Watchmen graphic novels and all that. So, yeah, would say, I guess, more film buff just because I have way more knowledge on that. So then what was uh, the first film that made you cry? That's a tough one because I do get emotional, but to cry... Hmm. Maybe not so well-known movie called Mr. Nobody, actually starring Jared Leto, who I guess may not be so popular with the internet these days. Yeah, it's a really good movie for the people who haven't heard of it. Imagine someone's life, but you get to see all aspects of what it could have been. Like, what if he dated this girl? You get to see that. But what if he didn't date this girl and now he dates this girl? Or what if he ended up with his dad when they divorced? Or what if he ended up with his mom? Uh, really cool like gimmick in my opinion for the movie and also just the way all the different little story threads play out and stuff it was very emotional you've mentioned i i believe your favorite directors who's your least favorite director that's i think overhyped i don't have too many negative opinions so i guess if i had to pick who i don't know the name of the people but i'm a big horror guy mm -hmm. and whoever's doing the most recent halloween movies not too big on it. <laughs> i like the halloween the first reboot the one they did like about 2 years ago the halloween kills Mm -mm, not for me it kind of got way too like i don't know inch mobby and all that like it didn't feel like a michael myers movie to me it's like all the supporting cast got got all of the time and michael myers just showed up for one or two scenes yeah like not only that but then tommy doyle like oh man they killed that character i don't i didn't like how he played they portrayed him everyone had no brain in that movie like everyone should know what michael myers not like looks like but like his composure his body physique like he's such a well-known figure right so how are you going to confuse him with that one like lunatic that got away and all that like i just felt like there were some stupid things in that movie fair enough i mean not all movies definitely hit out of the park and horror the horror genre itself is i think misunderstood in a lot of aspects as well too but there's been oh, some definitely. there's been some great psychological horror that like when i saw the the first and second saw that was a more of a psychological horror to me than than it was a gruesome it was gruesome don't get me wrong but 
it was more psychological in that aspect. No, I agree. I completely agree. And then it then it eventually became more of a gore fest and all that. They lost their their train of thought after after you get past three movies and you're in just six, seven, eight. Look at the Fast and Furious franchise. Just saying, mm -hmm. it just starts to get away from you. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, I agree. Even like one of my favorites is Freddy Krueger. Yep. I love all of his movies, but even him, like he does start to kind of trail off towards the end. Like, what are we doing here? We're getting to Looney Tunes territory. Although the uh, Freddy versus Jason, I did see that in theaters. I thought that was from a comedic standpoint. It was it was well done. Oh no, I loved that movie. That was my first one in theaters, my first Freddy movie, and yeah, loved it. <laughs> As a writer, then, do you think someone could become a writer if they don't feel emotions? That's a hard one. I guess if they can truly understand emotion, then maybe. But to not feel any at all, I don't know. That's a tough one. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Just when I was reading, I can't tell you what book it was, but I was an avid reader when I was young and a good turn of phrase, a well-written paragraph, like, man, they can just hit hard. So what's your most underappreciated novel that you read? I got to go with uh, Animorphs. It might seem not underappreciated because a lot of people probably remember from their childhood days, but if you reread those, at least the later books, it gets really mature and has like a lot of things dealing with war and war crimes. I, I don't want to, I guess, spoil it just in case some people do want to reread it. But like, man, like the leader loses a relative, like uh, just a lot of things go on and you wouldn't expect in a children's series. And if you read some of the like side books that go into like a lot of the backstories and stuff, it, it just really, it gets crazy for a children's book. It surprised me. Following the Animorphs uh, theme there, what would be your spirit animal? A gorilla. Big fan of Donkey Kong. So I, I don't know if it's because of that, but I'm also just a fan of, fan of gorillas. So like, yeah, I, I would go with the gorilla. Sometimes I say turtles because also I'm a big fan of Ninja Turtles, but not gorilla. Okay, who's your favorite Ninja Turtle? Everyone has one. Donatello. Also, probably the main reason why purple is my favorite color. I'm into bow staffs as a weapon. Yeah, Donatello's the man. I also can relate to him probably the most. Underappreciated in so many levels. Can you fix the turtle wagon? Uh, sure, why not? Yeah, and then, hey, I need some backup to kick some foot ninja ass. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe in writer's block? Yes, because writer's block isn't like you just can't think of anything to write about, right? You're just stuck on ideas. I believe in it. I also have a remedy. I don't know if some people might consider it stealing. I don't think so. It's more like just inspiration. But the way I like to write, I like to throw on like a movie or a TV show or something in the background. Just so in moments where like, I can't think of something to write. I have something to look at, but maybe it also might inspire an idea and stuff. So I like to do that. I recommend it for some people, but I do know some people like writing in silence. So yeah. How many unfinished stories do you have? Tons, tons. I wish I kept more, but I have notebooks of writing stories when I was even in high school and things like that. I used to write a lot of fan fictions, some things just about like my friends thrown into random adventures I have tons. <laughs> I even have some that I want to just expand upon, like probably after this series. For example, I have this one where I think it's a really great idea based on uh, Rock Band, the game. Mm -hmm. I have like these four characters I created that I always recreate in every new game. It's kind of like a road journey, but each chapter would be a different story written from one of the band members' point of view. So the whole book or comic or however I want to approach it would be like a collection, like a journal of all their different entries from different band members' points of views and stuff. Well, you should totally do that. That sounds like an awesome, awesome gig, man. Jeez. Yeah, it's going to be for the next one. <laughs> at what point are we good enough? I guess it depends good enough at what. But I would say as soon as you're able to read, think, and speak. No, nah, let me not say that. I would say as soon as you're maybe around like the 15, 16-year-old mark where you're old enough and mature enough to be doing a lot like you know some more serious and responsible things and i've seen some 16 year olds be like entrepreneurs and even start writing their own comics at that age so why not what stands between you and complete happiness myself because <laughs> i feel like i have a pretty good and happy life everything around me is awesome it's just myself i'm the one who gets myself down at points why is that I don't know. It could just be events of the day. It could just be me having a bad mood. But I feel like I don't really have anything truly that I can complain about and be like, man, life sucks. Like you said earlier, you know, everyone's job can be rough, especially nowadays. We're all so short staffed and stuff, but it's not the end of the world, you know? 
what is something that everyone should experience once in their lifetime? That's a tough one. I guess definitely just getting on a plane and experience something other than where you live. Go experience a whole other continent, country, and see the culture and everything there. Experience something completely new. It's a definite, definite life changer. What's the second wisest thing that someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your journey? These are good ones. These are good and tough. Second wisest, I guess just be yourself. Always stay true to yourself and never, ever be fake as in like, don't try and make someone else happy by being someone you're not because then you're not going to be happy. You always have to be putting up that front for whoever or whatever it is. Just stay true to yourself and that's how you live a happy life. Going back to your first question. How have you stayed true to yourself? Just reveling in my hobbies, gaming, watching TV, movies, reading, hanging out with family and friends. Just always do things that make you happy. Hardest video game you've ever played and beaten? I guess off the top of my head, I got to throw out Cuphead just because I have actually 100% of that game. Got all the secrets, all the achievement. It's pretty tough fun. So I guess I'll just throw that off the top of my head. A game, a game you probably haven't played, and if you have, then you're in the right category battle toads Ooh, i have played it but never fully beat it yeah i gotta get on that i gotta get on that it's not like widely available as far as i know oh no it is on rare replay i just don't have it i'm gonna get that i'm gonna get that consider that a challenge for myself i'm gonna beat it i'm gonna post it when i do in one sentence who are you and you stumped me on this one <laughs> all right uh how about let's go with a stubborn creator i don't know if that's too short but yeah a stubborn creator because man i can be stubborn and like you got to be in this industry you got to stick with your ideas like i said just never give up on them it's hard to like summarize yourself you know in one sentence everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who was that for you for me, I've got to say it's David Lynch as a creator. I just think he creates such wonderful stories, such imagery, thought-provoking material. A lot of people say it's pretentious, but I just, I love the fact that like I rewatch it, any of his work, and I just always find something new, something interesting to talk about. People can just talk about all of his work endlessly. It's just amazing. My mom, after my dad died, like I said, when I was about 13 years old, she stepped up, had to pull double duty as mother and father. I could speak endlessly about all the things she's done ever since to be still successful and just keep up with me, you know. And yeah, I, there's no one out there more supportive than my mom. Having my firstborn in a couple months, and obviously I'm not a single parent, but already the thought of like, wow, I'm going to have a kid. And now just picturing my mom having to deal with me when I was 13 by herself, it's like, oof. Well, congratulations, by the way. Thank you. From a professional perspective, you have created a comic. You are working with amazing, talented people, and you are creating more comics in the future. And you're going to have a campaign coming up uh, in, the, in the near future, hopefully as well, too. And we'll have to get you back on to talk about that as well. Uh, so it's an open invitation. So professionally, awesome. you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yes, 100%. I have achieved what my dream was as a kid to become a writer and have something out there. So 100%. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Just come back two times stronger. You just got to keep working at it and fix whatever you find wrong with what, why you fail. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you'll have the younger generation soon enough will be inspired by your creative talents, I'm sure, in the future. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Just to keep working hard, keep being creative, keep having awesome stories and just look for any opportunity to put something out there that hasn't been put out there yet. Uh, you mentioned Bleach early on in the interview. How excited are you about the final season that's being animated now? Because I'm looking forward to it. Oh my it. God. So excited. I, so excited that like it, it was kind of getting to the point where I used to say, I'm not going to read the last few manga chapters until they do the anime, right? My friends were like, they're never going to do it. They're never going to do it. Just read it. And about a year ago, I was finally going to break down. I was like, man, I guess they're really never going to do it. Just out of laziness, I never still got around to it. 
But then, hey, we got the announcement, and now I can tell my friends, hey, remember I told you guys? <laughs> oh, so super God. excited. Uh, same here. I was just, and the animation, like the trailer looks beautiful. Like, oh my God. Yeah, it's oh my, amazing, amazing. My uh, girlfriend, she's, that's one of the few animes uh, she watches. I got her into it, and yeah, she's just as excited too. If only they could kind of like redo the old series in this new animation style, I think it would just be just blow it out of the water. Like, I love yeah, it. who knows? Maybe if this new one does really well, maybe they'll give it the Kai treatment or something, you know, yeah. cut out the black and yeah, touch up the visuals or something. That'd be cool. As long as they have the twirling leak, I mean, that's, that's all that matters. So yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a classic. All right. I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Edwin, I do greatly appreciate you coming on the show. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And, you know, I got to get you back on for the Kickstarter whenever that comes out. Yeah, I'd love the opportunity. And thank you again for this opportunity. But yeah, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Lost Between World One. On Instagram at lost underscore between underscore world one. On Facebook, I'm lost between worlds book series. And I have my own website. It's uh, www.lostbetweenworldscomics.com. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.